And I'm gonna hand it over to Mike to do a little introduction. Okay, thanks, Ann. Um, Mike Brady here. So I thought it'd be a good idea to have the IARPIC team leads here do a quick introduction. Uh, and also if you can introduce yourself and then I'll go last we can start getting through the agenda. I have a lot, I have a few key messages I wanna kind of plow through. We have a packed agenda. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of do this efficiently. So Anne, if you wanna introduce yourself. Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Anne. Um, uh, I've got the Grand Canals Fellow at NOAA right now. And part of my duties are helping and staffing the IARPIC Secretariat. So I'm helping the Arctic Data Team, the Environmental Intelligence Team and the Modeling Team to put on their uh, meetings. Hi, and I'm Jonathan Blythe. I'm the co-lead for the data, IARPIC data collaboration team. And I, um, and my co-lead, Mike, has organized this meeting. So I'll pass it off to him. Thanks, uh, Mike Brady, uh, Arctic data team co-lead, uh, cartographer in the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Maritime Safety Office. I'm also assistant to the uh, Senior Geospatial Intelligence Authority for Maritime at NGA. Um, so uh, what I want to do is just briefly introduce IARPIC, uh, the data team, and uh, this meeting just to orient everyone. I'm sure you know, I know many on this call are well, very familiar with what IARPIC is, uh, more so than me, uh, but I think it's a good idea to, to check in uh, why we're all joining these, these calls. As a reminder, the Federal Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, IARPIC, is charged with enhancing uh, scientific monitoring and research on global environmental issues in the Arctic. The IARPIC established the virtual IARPIC collaboration space, the space that we're on uh, here, uh, to connect federal and uh, non-federal government researchers and stakeholders to address hard problems defined in the IARPIC five-year plan. Uh, the Arctic Data Team is one of 12 collaboration teams. It is a sub-team of the Environmental Intelligence Team. Uh, so we're uh, really focused on use-inspired research uh, and that's reflected in our uh, in the data team's performance areas that are defined in the IARPIC five-year plan. So to that end, uh, I'm, I've been working with uh, co-lead uh, Jonathan Blythe with, uh, with BOEM on developing a standing theme on enhancing access and usability of Arctic data. Uh, so this includes a high -level discussing high-level policy issues like the uh, Evidence Act of 2018, and uh, we also address data usability. Uh, specifically, uh, we're, we're incorporating the co-production method by proactively engaging um, uh, practitioners in addition to scientists in the conversation on Arctic data resources and requirements. So the meeting today, we're, we're focused on expanding on our practitioner engagement, uh, focused on today on the cross-cutting issue, exploring local Arctic community benefits of automatic identification system or AIS data, uh, also known as uh, ship traffic data. Uh, and the objective of this short meeting is to try to spark an interest in continuing the conversation on this topic uh, within the IARPIC and perhaps expanding on it in the future, such as on these calls, um, maybe a panel or even, even a workshop going forward. Uh, so also please keep in mind that the IARPIC is, is currently updating its five-year plan. And this drives uh, uh, much of our activities here. Uh, so. As you're, as you're hearing the presentations, please think about suggestions you may have for updating the plan. Uh, the data team will submit uh, its recommendations by the two August deadline. Uh, so I'm gonna ask that questions and comments uh, and this call really try to uh, center on the, uh, shaping that, that plan going forward to the degree that it's possible or makes sense. So we did cram a lot into this one hour. Uh, we're gonna hold verbal uh, questions and comments until we get through all three presentations. And if, uh, unless, of course, presenters want to uh, leave a little time at the end of their, uh, their, their presentation. Uh, please use the chat box and comments uh, for comments and questions. We're going to be uh, scanning those, trying to incorporate that whenever time we have our discussion at the end. We're also going to include that in meeting notes. Uh, and again, think about that IARPIC plan. Try to sh like shape your questions for helping us move forward to, to bring value to this community through looking at Arctic data. Um, so, so overview for presentations today. We have three presentations. We'll start with a a short primer on Arctic spatial data, uh, data infrastructure uh, to provide some additional structure to the conversation. Uh, then we'll uh, hear a presentation on the Army Corps of Engineers AIS analysis package. And then we'll uh, explore local community benefits of access to AIS data. So I'm gonna briefly introduce each presenter as, um, uh, as, as, they, as they come up. First, we have uh, Sebastian Caricio, he is Technical uh, lead technical cartographic analyst in the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Maritime Safety Office. 
Uh, Sebastian also has uh, many leadership roles in the International Hydrographic Organization, including chair of the I, uh, IHO's Arctic Regional Marine Spatial Data Infrastructure Working Group. So very relevant for this conversation today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sebastian uh, to talk about uh, SDI. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mike. So um, first of all, just a quick primer here. Um, spatial Data Infrastructure, or SDI, when we talk about that, we're talking about the technologies, the policies, and institutional arrangements that facilitate the availability of and access to spatial data. So you'll hear me also mention MSDI or Marine Spatial Data Infrastructure. Basically, that's the same thing. It's taking those policies and governance, uh, the standards, the technological resources, and then also the data and the metadata. And in our case with the MSDI, we're talking about Marine Spatial Data. So the, the whole concept here behind Spatial Data Infrastructures is really embracing those fair data principles. And by that, I mean, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, so uh, for a lot of the government who's um, uh, attending this meeting, uh, probably very familiar with FGDC um, and the Geospatial Data Act of 2018. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of players uh, involved in, in that to provide um, geospatial data, it really codifies and, and makes it uh, uh, possible for those agencies to, to have um, a little uh, extra mandate there, I guess, to, to make sure that they're providing things in a, in a way that's very, very usable. Um, uh, my agency, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, we're engaged uh, quite a bit uh, with, with those uh, government partners, but also in the international community as well. Um, so as, as Mike mentioned, um, the International Hydrographic Organization, uh, we participate uh, within the Marine Spatial Data Infrastructures Working Group there. There's also the OGC, or Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, Marine Domain Working Group. Um, there's also the United Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management, or UNGGIM. Uh, within there, there's also a working group on marine geospatial information. Um, and, uh, and I should mention that the UNGGIM is uh, has created something called the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework, or the IGIF. Um, and this basically provides a basis and a guide for developing, integrating, strengthening, uh, and maximizing, maximizing geospatial information and related resources uh, in all countries around the world. So I would definitely encourage everybody to go take a look at, at the I, IGIF, as it's called. Um, so that IGIF and the SDI concept, those things kind of blend together. Um, so within the Arctic, there's the Arctic Regional Hydrographic Commission, which is made up of IHO uh, member states uh, uh, or International Hydrographic Organization member states. Um, within there, there is the Arctic Regional Marine Spatial Data Infrastructures Working Group, and that's the, that's the group that I'm chairing. Um, so basically, we're trying to facilitate the marine uh, uh, spatial data side uh, for the Arctic region, uh, basically by providing hydrographic uh, source data as kind of the foundational data um, and then and encourage uh, the participation from other marine data providers uh, to contribute to that as well. So uh, we also collaborate with the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure, uh, which is a group of eight uh, national mapping agencies that reflect the same uh, eight nations that are uh, within the Arctic Council and uh, Basically, we're trying to collaborate and, and, and help kind of bring that uh, land foundational data and the marine foundational data together in a common spatial data infrastructure where a broad user base can use that, that information. Um, so uh, I, just a couple of years ago, and I spoke about this, I think the last time I was here at the, this meeting, um, sorry, not a couple of years ago, just last year, um, we finished the marine spatial data infrastructures um, concept development study, which was a study that was run uh, through the Open Geospatial Consortium um, and strongly uh, supported by the, the IHO. Um, we're looking to transition that study into a marine spatial data pilot. And uh, one of the use cases we want to take a look at there is uh, the ocean terrestrial use case. So basically the land sea interface that we're trying to do and being able to share data in those two different domains. Um, but share them in a common way that, that we can start um, 
uh, have a broader user base access and, and really, really be able to utilize this data for whatever it is that, that they need to. So, um, so that's kind of why, why we're here. Um, we, you know, we need to be able to partner together with industry and academia and government um, all together because no one really can kind of catch up if, if others leave them behind and, and no one can really operate fully without contributions from all those sectors. So um, it's very important for all of us to, to continue to remain engaged and, and uh, be interoperable in, in more than just the data, but um, in, in how we're interacting and, and supplying information back and forth as well. Um, so uh, that's it. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too far over, but thank you very much. Yep. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Sebastian. So that was meant to be a primer. Uh, uh, very good governance background. We'll call this the practitioner space for the purpose of this call. And we're thinking about if you weren't aware of all those governance um, uh, entities and, and, and activities in the science, more kind of science world, that's what we're here for is to kind of uh, uh, identify new partnerships going forward. And what better topic than AIS ship traffic data than to talk about uh, a use case for merging uh, ocean and terrestrial based spatial data infrastructure worlds. That said, we're gonna move on to uh, Dr. Marion Kress, uh, research physicist scientist at the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, she's gonna uh, present on the AIS um, uh, analysis package that the Army Corps of Engineers has developed. So that said, uh, Dr. Uh, Kress, please take, take it away. Hi. This is Marin Kress. Uh, I'm sharing my screen, so you should all be able to see the first slide that says Automatic Identification System Analysis Package. Uh, I guess the folks who are on video nod if you can see it, so I can make sure. Okay, thumbs up. Great. So I'm part of a larger team. Uh, we call ourselves informally Navigation Data Team uh, across the Army Corps uh, because our focus is usually on supporting uh, use-safe infrastructure maintenance needs, and so that has driven a lot of the development for this software. So moving on to the next slide. Um, I wasn't sure about the, the background of the folks on this call. So uh, the ASAP tool gets its data from the Coast Guard NAIS system. This includes the vessel identification information, location, uh, and some of the other automatically generated uh, information about the vessel position. Discrete data points, uh, this can be transmission frequency of, you know, as close as six seconds down to two seconds if they're certain maneuvering. And for our research, we often treat the vessels as like passive probes, um, you know, representing some either sort of weather condition um, or infrastructure state. And there is, of course, a network of both Coast Guard maintained and partner maintained terrestrial towers, including the Marine Exchange of Alaska, which I believe Captain Ed is going to talk about more. Uh, so this is terrestrial data, and I did just want to point out that ASAP does uh, get just terrestrial data as far as we know. So there is that higher time resolution, but that can mean also limited spatial coverage depending on tower location, uh, whereas with satellite AIS, you get uh, you know, less frequent, uh, what I've been told is about 15 minutes uh, time resolution, but a broader spatial coverage. Uh, for those of you who have not yet worked with AIS data. I just wanted to put in a couple of considerations here. Uh, there are always GPS errors that can lead to a jumping signal, especially um, in urban areas or next to grain elevators or large uh, metal equipment. We do see that uh, because the GPS signal gets uh, confused. Things like typos or blanks in the message. Uh, of course, AIS is not on every vessel. And uh, this can uh, sort of give a, a false negative, I would want to say, about use, because if you have small vessels that are using a navigation project, of course, you can't see them, uh, so you have to find other ways to, to capture that information. And just as a reminder, so ASAP is a pass-through for terrestrial data from the Coast Guard NEIS. It does not do any QA, QC on the data itself. And for folks who are not already aware, I will just give a little plug for the US DOT C-Vision program that does provide access to satellite data, uh, and the, the website is there at the bottom. I'm not uh, affiliated with it, but uh, I just want to make people aware it's open to uh, government personnel. So uh, coverage map, you can see the, the call out for Alaska uh, with the Marine Exchange Towers in the lower left corner of this slide uh, with the orange boxes there. So pretty extensive coverage around the coast of Alaska. Uh, when you get down to the mainland U.S., there's both coastal and inland coverage, but you can see it's not 
complete. So we do know that there are coverage gaps, and that's something that we're trying to both quantify and fill in over time as, uh, as real estate and connectivity issues allow. Um, AIS use example. So I did want to share, I know there's a, there's a variety of practitioners and researchers here, and so these are some of the topics that our broader research group or the, the ERDIC laboratories are working on that all use AIS data. They range from uh, very, uh, very closely related dwell time analyses, we do work for the Department of Transportation on that topic, different aspects of port system resiliency, uh, vessel activity before and after any sort of construction event. Uh, one thing that might be relevant for the IARPIC group is looking at vessel structure interaction. For example, breakwaters, um, examining if even though a breakwater is deteriorated physically, does it still serve its uh, function, uh, as well as invasive species risk because of system connectivity. And the last one, which is probably actually the most important, is the overall um, improving the understanding of waterway usage, right? Just getting folks who are not on the water every day, uh, getting them uh, better information about how heavily utilized some of these places are. Uh, so onto the software. So how ASAP works, this is just a little schematic here. Starting in the upper left corner, uh, we have the, the Coast Guard archive, and then the uh, AIS query tool shown in the upper right part of this diagram calls to that archive through some web services. So unlike um, if you've done a request uh, directly to the Coast Guard NAVSEN where it goes to a person and then they do the work to, to look up and pull the data uh, manually, this is machine to machine. Um, and so there's that query tool function. And then once data is pulled from the Coast Guard archive into the ASAP tool, it's stored in a, a data cache. So that's represented by those uh, stacks of silver uh, disks in the lower right corner of the screen. And once data is pulled into the cache, it is stored indefinitely because you might have multiple users accessing that same data. And so that, that actually causes the library to grow over time. So the more users, and, and the longer that the software is functioning, then the, the more the library is growing. Once that data is pulled in and available, then in the lower middle section, you can see the ASAP web portal with a, an interface there, and there are built-in analysis and visualization features. So you don't need to have a deep GIS background to use this and, and generate initial uh, graphics, uh, heat maps, and things. I'll give an example of some of those. Uh, alternately, uh, there are also data export functions. So if you want to uh, export a CSV or a KML of the data, uh, you can do that as well through the ASAP web portal. So you can work with data inside the portal and export it, or you can use the portal really just as a, an acquisition tool if, for example, if you prefer to work in ArcMap or any of other, um, you know, QGIS or any of the other open uh, geospatial platform, so you can use CSVs and bring the data right into there. So once you're in the, the software, uh, the way that you do access data from the Coast Guard, the way you submit a query is this, you know, sort of draw a bounded box here, and it does have to be a box. It's always a, a rectangle of some sort. And then that uh, request has two parts. There's two web services that are generated from that. Uh, the first one is to get all of the vessels that transited the box over your defined date range, which uh, the user can set. And then the second part of that is once you get that list of vessels, then they get the position reports for the observed vessels. And that is further uh, customizable in uh, this way. So you can choose whether you want uh, position reports that are simply just inside that bounded box. Uh, this is very popular for our users who are looking at a uh, specific piece of infrastructure, a, a levee, uh, a curb, a bend in a river maybe where they're investigating some sort of vessel behavior, and you're really not interested in what's happening you know, upstream, downstream, inshore, offshore. You just want to know what's happening right there. And so we call those box-limited queries where the, the position reports are only inside that bounded box. Uh, however, there is another application, and so you can see the um, for the box limited queries, there's a, a tiny little green and, and yellow uh, track lines that are showing up there. Um, the other alternative is if you want to see 
not just what happened inside the box, but for any vessel that passed through the box, where it went uh, or came from before, before it went through the box. And so this is, we call the tracer method. And so this works effectively at port entrances where there's a very um, a bottleneck of some sort where definitely traffic would be passing through there and then you could uh, add that vessel to the list and then it gets tracked for a, a longer amount of time. For example, an entire month, you can see where it went. So if there is any interest in connectivity, you know, system connectivity, if you're looking at movement between ports or between regions, uh, that's the kind of data query that you would want to do. And I'm spending time on these because this gets to that um, kind of thinking about how you're going to use the data right up at the beginning when you're requesting it from the Coast Guard. So, of course, if you change your mind later on, you can always request more. Um, and box limited queries are a little bit smaller. So, if you're um, going to be handling lots of data sets, that's just another consideration of uh, data size. So, I mentioned the library and that once data is pulled from the Coast Guard into the ASAP software, it stays indefinitely. And there is a way to search through the library to see what is already there. Uh, this helps you save time. It saves a uh, uh, burden on the machine-to-machine the -machine request to the Coast Guard. These are, uh, these, all of these gray uh, boxes are examples of previous requests that have been pulled in. So you can do a spatial search and it, um, say, you know, show me everything that already exists for New York Harbor or Delaware Bay, and you get uh, both a, a map view on the right where you can click on any of the boxes to get information about the data contained in that request, or this uh, list view on the left. And so you can see there's a variety of uh, library entries that returned there. And this library is continuously growing as more users uh, request more data. So once data is pulled in and you've uh, done some processing with an ASAP, uh, this is sort of project view where you have a control panel, if you will, on the left side of the screen and then uh, a map view on the right. And so some of the built-in capabilities that are right there within the software are these heat maps, cluster maps, maps, and track line, which uh, you can see here an example from the North Slope area from 2018. There are also some statistics that are automatically generated and then you can do further dwell time analysis. Uh, transit counts, vessel speed analysis, and so forth. Uh, in case cluster plot is, is not familiar terminology, this, this is what we call them. Uh, you might call it a bubble map as well. And that's just giving you a quantifiable view of what, um, how many signals are, are underlying that, that position. Uh, because when you get to uh, track lines, for example, in this previous figure, you can get so many track lines overlaid, especially when you're dealing with year-long or multi-year data, that it's hard to really get a sense of the, the density. Uh, whereas with the cluster maps, you can see, okay, there were you know over 3,000, almost 4,000 position reports in this one place over the year. And these uh, maps do scale. So as you zoom in and out, the bubbles will sort of aggregate or disaggregate, so you can get a more nuanced view within the software. One of the uh, most popular types of visualizations that are generated or that can be generated within ASAP are these heat maps. Uh, they're really, of course, uh, signal density maps. And so uh, I was asking Captain Ed earlier about coverage uh, from the Marine Exchange Tower. And so there's an example um, in the upper right with the gray map background showing. So for 2018, there, uh, we have access to uh, quite a bit of data that goes uh, offshore. Um, and these heat maps also will scale. So as you zoom in or out, there will be aggregation or disaggregation. And the scaling is adjustable. So the user can customize it. You know, you don't want um, to you know, have one hot spot that might sort of blow out the rest of your map um, if you're trying to make a clear communication tool. Uh, track lines, which are another very popular feature. Uh, so track lines are generated by taking individual position reports which look like these uh, sort of freestanding dots uh, you might be able to see in the lower left image. These uh, individual position reports are just connected with a straight line. And so I tell people if you have a very curvy waterway or you need uh, very high fidelity data, then you want you know, maybe 30-second position reports or, or one minute might be sufficient. 
However, if you're just looking for sort of general trends, you know, you might do five minute, you might do one hour, uh, and you can adjust that sampling rate uh, depending on the need. Uh, once you have track lines, you can color code them in different ways. So the example on the left is showing by vessel type, and that is the vessel type that is broadcast in the AIS message. Again, we don't do QA, QC on that, so we do see a lot of uh, not available, a surprising number of WIG vessels, um, and uh, the color coding is, uh, is preset there, as you can see in the left legend. Uh, the upper right, you can color code those exact same vessel tracks here. This is the same area off uh, Kivalina, Alaska. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Uh, the upper right image is showing color coding by vessel speed for the duration of that transit. So if you're interested in uh, you know, how fast are vessels going, maybe at different times of day, different times of year, you can, you can get a visual of that pretty quickly. And then the lower right uh, image is showing vessel track lines so color coded by draft. And so the scale here is going from 0 to 40, and that scale is adjustable. So you can, if you know that, for example, it's a very shallow draft area and you would have no more than 10 foot vessels, you can adjust that um, scale from 0 to 10. If you're going offshore and you have a wider variety, you can adjust that maximum upwards and then uh, redisplay the data. Uh, within the uh, ASAP software, when you process data in your area of interest, there are these summary statistics that are automatically generated. So they're, they're handy little snapshots. Uh, they tell you, if you look in that upper left section where it says summary, uh, you can see the report date range. So that tells you the, the time that you're looking at, uh, the number of reports that were captured within that time, and then the number of unique vessels that generated those reports that were, that were captured in the data request. And then there's some other uh, vessel characteristics. Obviously with the Army Corps and our mission for maintaining um, navigation infrastructure, we're interested in the size of the vessels that are using navigation channels and associated dredging requirements. So we're very interested in some of those parameters. And this data, um, this exportable, if you see those little icons that look like three horizontal lines, uh, black lines, clustered close together, those are our little export icons, so you can get uh, CSV files of any of these kinds of summary data. Um, another useful function that's built into the software are these time history plots. So here's one that's showing average speed. So this was for um, a large area of the Alaskan coast for all of 2018, and so you can imagine that as more vessels go on the water in the summer months, so the overall average speed across all of those vessels is decreasing. That's what you're seeing here. And then the converse of that is this next plot, which is called, um, again, same, same, same time history, but it's a transit count. And so you see that the number of transits is increasing. Uh, starting around June and going through about November. And you can also get, you know, daily summaries of these types of changes if you're interested in it. So you can, you can adjust with this. There's some customizable uh, options within the software. Um, a couple of frequently asked questions that, that people, people often raise. Uh, how long is the coverage? So we have access to a, basically a rolling window of data in the Coast Guard archive that goes as far back as three years and about as recent as three hours ago. So ASAP is not designed for any sort of real-time monitoring. It's really for historical analysis of waterway use. Um, however, that is for new requests. So if you are you know, sitting here today and you make a new request, you can reach back as far as three years. But as that library continues to grow, uh, eventually uh, data that is older than three years uh, might be available from previous requests that have been made and stored in the library. Uh, we also have an internal site that might have uh, older data as well uh, for certain areas. Um, the two images on the right are examples of custom area of interest polygons that the user can draw. So you might um, request data for a large area, say an entire section of coastline, but what you really want to do is look at individual sections of it so you can customize, you know, you can click on the vertices and draw these polygons yourself. So you can make them match uh, political boundaries, uh, environmental features, essential fish habitat, so any sort of spatial 
designation that's of interest. Uh, shapefile import is available, so if you have already gone through the work of creating very specific polygons in um, another type of software, you can import those uh, shapefiles into ASAP and use them as an area of interest. You don't have to redraw them within the software. Um, and again, there is uh, CSV export and KML export capability uh, for results that are generated within the software. And I do have uh, tutorials available. We can set up a separate uh, training session as needed. So um, in closing, the next step would be how to access ASAP. So for those who are interested, you can go to the website and request an account. Um, for uh, .gov or .mil emails, it's a fairly straightforward uh, registration process. Um, if you have another um, .edu or other type of account, we do need a signed agreement in place before your account can be activated. Um, and so if there are local governments, uh, state government, federal government users, um, and you have any sort of other kind of email for another reason, uh, we encourage people to just reach out and, and talk to us about that. And this is really for sort of crowd control because this is a, a research tool and there are uh, limited processing capabilities under the hood. Uh, we just have to um, restrict access somewhat. And uh, for those who do uh, get access or are interested in using this tool, there are practice exercises. We can set up training webinars, so my email is there. Um, and with that, I will just say thank you for your attention and I think my 20 minutes are up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marin. Perfect. Uh, good timing. Lots of great content. Clearly an invaluable uh, AS data resource. I know there are lots of questions, but I, I am going, we are going to move on to the next speaker. And I really want to get people thinking, you know, bend the conversation towards what are the requirements from the local community perspective. Um, can you hear me, Ed? You're making, uh, can you hear me, Ed? You're, you're on mute there, Ed. So uh, we'll make sure Ed's got audio. I'm mute now. I'm on. Oh, we can hear you. Very good. Okay, so I'm very excited to introduce uh, Captain Ed Page, a retired Coast Guard officer. Uh, Ed is also um, executive director of Marine Exchange of Alaska. He's got over 30 years in the Marine field up in Alaska, uh, so clearly very relevant. Uh, and, and he, we're very excited to have him. Really, now I can't make it work. What's that? Oh, okay, I'm trying to get this thing up on the screen right now. Go ahead, continue on the discussion. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, and so this is, you know, this is really the goal here is to like start seeing at this data through the eyes of local community requirements. Clearly, we're not, you know, all part of the local community there. Uh, so we're relying on Ed to give us uh, that some of that picture. Again, thinking is this a conversation we want to continue in the future uh, through expanded uh, fora on the topic. So um, we'll just. Um, Wait for uh, maybe end if you want to bring up the slides and we'll just verbally yeah. advance. It's it's fine. We can. I know you have a lot of great slides, so we're going to make sure they get up one way or another. Uh, yeah. Do, for some reason, I can't seem to. Uh, I'm just going to figure out how to work this thing now. I had it up earlier. Yep. And. Uh, Is it not uh, screen sharing? It's not on screen share. I can't even get the Zoom thing up at the moment. That's why I just kind of lost it here for a second. Oh, if you go down to your toolbar, there should be a little camera symbol for the Zoom meeting. So I do have that. And then, all right. So, do you see all all of us in the little little screen? Okay. All right. We're going to do this now. I'm going to share screen. Um, can you see it now? Yes. Success. Very good. Take it away. Good. So um, we're going to show some of the applications that we have up in Alaska uh, for AIS. And so, uh, and we, how we get this data to the hands of the local communities, the users, it's a kind of different audience than what you're looking at uh, and how it's applied. So that's what I'm going to go through real quickly. And of course, some of the things, the Arctic Maritime Shipping Assessment and whatever, when they start looking to, at the Arctic, they start talking about the value of AIS in marine mammal awareness and, and expanding the AIS network, whatever. We are... Aside from Prince William Sound, which I think there's five AIS stations, the other, we have 130 AIS stations in Alaska built by a nonprofit, Marine Exchange of Alaska. We are the, Marine, the Coast Guard's AIS network. They, don't, they didn't build one in Alaska, other than a couple in the Prince William Sound. So we are the AIS network. Uh, we, you know, we also look at, uh, when we built this network, uh, we, we looked at dialogue from the Arctic Maritime Shipping Assessment to talk about placing a premium on ship monitoring and tracking. 
talked about protection of uh, Arctic people, those in the Arctic coastal communities and traditional lifestyles. So we've been engaged in ensuring they are the, uh, some of the customers along with many others, obviously. Uh, and then this is our operation center. It's a 24 hour operation center in Juneau, Alaska. Uh, that's our building. And uh, we're monitoring over 1.5 million square miles, actively monitoring, contacting vessels when the wrong areas entered ATBAs. We established a uh, area to be avoided 50 miles offshore, basically in some cases longer, depending for tankers, all to the Aleutian Islands left in the Arctic, in some cases closer because you don't have 50 miles. But we actively monitoring and we got 4,500 vessels enrolled in the system agree to comply with these procedures. We contact them all the time. We see a vessel slowing down, broken down, entering the wrong area, et cetera. They respond, they act accordingly. So uh, that's what we do 24 hours a day. We're doing maritime domain awareness and moving into maritime domain management. We're actually managing traffic and managing risk by engaging vessels and not waiting for them to suddenly end up on the beach and responding. Uh, Arctic, you cannot respond to oil spills. I worked at Exxon Valdez spill for three years. There's still oil up there. We spent $3 billion. I do not believe in oil spill response. Sorry. Got to do it, but it's uh, much better off preventing and much better return on investment. And so uh, I'm all about preventing oil spills. I've also done a lot of search and rescue cases over the years. I realize that better information, lives are saved. And so this has been used extensively for preventing oil spills, preventing casualties, search and rescue. All this information is, is applied. This is our network of, of AIS receivers and weather stations, all just sponsored by and funded by the Alaska Ocean Observing System. We have a project where we are basically taking AIS information, uh, uh, weather information and transmit over AIS and other means to make it more available, more accessible to vessels. So it's accelerating and improving the dissemination of safety information, environmental information uh, to mariners. Again, it's maritime domain awareness and maritime domain management. If you look at our screen right now in our operations center, this is what our crew is looking at, but they filter it all the time. There's constantly a whole bunch of filters they use for the areas can enter and no enter, alerts, uh, alerts uh, go off in the operations center of vessel reduces speed below six knots. If you're watching a car on the highway going 10 miles an hour, you're going, something's wrong. Those cars going 55, why is he going 10? So we have alarms go off for that, alarms go in the wrong areas, a whole bunch of different alarms go off, and then we can investigate and, and find out if it's, it's a serious concern or just, not a big deal. So we, we obviously have color coding of all the vessels, different sort of different filters, et cetera. This is an example if you look at them in the big screen. We do our own historical analysis. Uh, and this is an example of our displays of taking our information and, and, and then analyzing what that traffic's like. We do a QAQC. There's a lot of misinformation. About 50% of the data is an error as far as the size of the vessel, type of vessel. When a vessel says other, it doesn't help you. You know, the type of vessel other does not help you. You need to know if it's a fishing vessel or a cargo vessel or a tanker, et cetera. So we, unfortunately, uh, we have about 150 years of Coast Guard experience. We have a couple of years of Alaska experience with a 20 person crew. So we understand the trade, we understand the ships, we know what, what looks out of, out of the order and what's not correct. So we, we do a QAC with all our data, uh, the dimensions of the vessel and the type of vessel and, and et cetera. Going on. This example, how trade has changed. Initially, most of the traffic, uh, and this is going back to uh, 2010, we, we go 10 years back in our data. Uh, we make sure we can look across the, the, the Bering Strait to analyze traffic. Well, most of the traffic was on our side of the Bering Strait. So you look at Russia on the left, top left, United States on the right side, it's a 42 mile narrow strait. Some people call it narrow. I'm not sure 42 miles is narrow in my mind. But anyway, most of the traffic was on our side. Why? Tug and barges. Oil, oil uh, exploration. Smaller vessels, not large ships, but smaller vessels that did have AIS and AIS carriage requirements have changed over the years. Not all vessels had to have AIS on domestic trade until 2014, I think it was. So it's evolved where more and more vessels have AIS, so that kind of skews the numbers. But now we're looking at last year, the traffic is, is changing now. There's more traffic on, a, on the Russian side as far as deep draft traffic. Uh, tankers and bulkers that are traveling there. We still have tugs and barges going on our side. Uh, so that's an example how things are changing over a period of time. And uh, I talked about preventing. Well, we made the front page of New York Times so we can just shut down the doors. We made success and call success and go home, but we're still working on it. But it did talk about the Arctic and fears of disaster rising. And they talked about our operation center and they quoted me. I was out kayaking and they still took my quote. And, it, and basically I said, it was the last word in the article that said, we should stop worrying about what's gonna, we could do when things go wrong. I said, we should prevent things from going wrong. So our whole focus is preventing things from going wrong and not really responding. Obviously our data is used 
alerts and they do respond. But we're hoping that we can give enough distance offshore, early notice, it's not a disaster. The response is really having a, a tug go out, meet a vessel and tow into port versus ending up on the beach and spilling oil and doing an oil spill response. So ours is all about keeping vessel offshore, have information, have time to do something about it before it's an extremis and have, know where the capabilities are and direct them to the, the location. This is our trend of traffic activity over the years. It's increasing, it's not dramatic, huge increase. I used to be the captain of Port for Los Angeles, Long Beach. These numbers don't, I wouldn't even mean anything in that case because there are thousands back there in, in LA, Long Beach. But this is the traffic we have in the Barron Strait. Uh, and, and over the years, of course, again, AIS carriage requirements has changed a little bit. Oil exploration has changed, shell has pulled out, and so that's changed the traffic density. Whatever. So it's many, when you dig into it, it's a lot of other discussion as far as what this really means. Uh, but we're also looking, we had a project with the Maritime Safety Net Project. Here's the maritime communities, the native communities, indigenous communities suddenly have all this larger traffic coming their way. Cruise ships all of a sudden show up off their beach and they don't know anything about it. So uh, they don't want to be run over by vessels. So then we originally started some pilot program trying different sensors, that little yellow box, the IES and a satellite transponder in a vessel. Uh, we moved beyond that, to, uh, working closely with the whaling parties of, 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 of Garmin, they call them, or Spot type of thing uh, on steroids at Delorme. There's a couple of different names for them uh, for tracking vessels, as well as a, a portable AIS unit we're going to show here in a minute. So we have a, a variety of different technologies so they can be visible and they can also be notified and learn of vessels in their area so they're not run over. So we're trying to get this, again, information out to a whole bunch of users. Uh, to minimize the adverse impacts of increased maritime activity in the Arctic. So here's an example with this little stick and go, I call them, self-contained, battery operated. We put them on barges, we don't have IS on them. We put them on native whalers, et cetera, uh, to, to track vessels. I like this one because I'm an avid kayaker. So the White House declared kayaking is the safest way to avoid just uh, uh, coronavirus. So I went out there and went kayaking. Again, I, I live on the water, so it's an easy thing for me to do. I often do before work. But I also established a portable AIS unit and just slapped it on top of my kayak and, and just show how easy it can be. It's driven by, uh, that's a DeWalt, or I guess not DeWalt, it um, doesn't matter. It was, it's a, a battery from a power drill. It's used to power my AIS units. It basically comes down to, we got a little more sophisticated. Now we put it in a box, pretty box, got a different power supply. But that's what we have that you can put on a native whale boat and you can pick them up. That's me kayaking actually, and it shows my course and speed. And um, it was picked up by both satellite and terrestrial AIS uh, systems. So this is where we're getting with this technology as far as the ability. So they're not invisible. They can be seen by other vessels. We know where they are. They can also know where other vessels are approaching them and minimize the likelihood of a, a, a collision between a transiting vessel and a, and a local vessel. And of course, there is a lot of schizophrenic activity up there in the North Slope, and just an example of some activity up there. Uh, we also work with the Coast Guard, what they call the Arctic Next Generation Navigational Safety Information System. And this getting information out to mariners, uh, not putting buoys in ice, which don't stay, but actually doing virtual aids of navigation and, and broadcasting location of whalers and other areas to be avoided, environmental data. Again, we work with AOS and combining uh, weather stations with AIS and transmit and weather information or AIS real time, updated every minute versus once an hour. And that's, we have raving fans on that system. Every time I talk to somebody, that seen the most important thing to them is this AS uh, weather system. They, they love it. So uh, we're constantly building upon that. We can also disseminate the information on location of whales. We've been working on that with our uh, park service, uh, Glacier Park, vessel distress, notifying areas of boys. So basically we're now transmitting over AS. We have 30 AS transmitters we've built in Alaska and transmitting information around those areas. And this example, some are AS uh, transmitters up in Alaska, getting information out to vessels, uh, whether it's a hazard to navigation or safety information, what have you. It's moving forward to getting better information, maritime domain awareness management. This, these are buoys in Cook Inlet that don't, can't stand still in the ice, obviously, but we can virtually transmit that information. Those examples of another. And then, then we had the Bering Strait, is now there's vessel traffic lanes. That information was uh, developed with AIS information to figure out where the vessels were going. Uh, NOAA and the Coast Guard said, well, that's where they're going. Let's make sure it's safe. Let's survey the air, make sure it's uh, adequate draft, and then let's draw some lines on the chart and get some information. So to kind of minimize and control traffic as they go through the areas of, of Bering Strait and environmentally sensitive areas. Bear in mind, though, the ice comes in place. So that th this vessel is not a drunken sailor. It's actually someone who's avoiding the ice 
uh, when was he transiting? I think in December or in January in this particular case, he was transiting through the Bering Strait. It was a tanker and obviously it's dodging ice. And, and so the idea of staying in the traffic lane is, is it's okay when you got ice-free water, it's not a good example or not something you can do easily when you got ice to deal with. And it's changing the traffic. Over the years, we're seeing the traffic season is, is lengthening to some degree because of less ice, but also a more capable vessels operating in the ice environment. Lastly, we've developed an app so the natives can actually see, uh, native communities sorry, can see where vessels are. So they can see on their smartphone and they can click on this icon and they can determine how far away and which vessels and, and uh, what information they want. They can be uh, provide alerts if they want alert or they can just go on it whenever they want and see where vessels are. So this is an app they can access. We give free access to them. Uh, we realize we're not getting revenues out of this, but we just feel like they should have the information in easy format. They don't have the power tools we've talked about beforehand of analysis, whatever. This is really a basic system so I can see where vessels are. And just an example of how we use a, these satellite transponders that are also used on uh, uh, whale boats. Um, and they can, and then we have a power user system we call it the pack tracks, which has all the playback capabilities and analysis capabilities and CFC files, et cetera, et cetera. They also have that information available to them. But basically that's a lap, that's not a, that's not a, a smartphone capability anymore. Now we're talking to laptops and or uh, computers. And lastly, we're doing watchdog systems now for the other uh, uh, stakeholders, if we will, NOAA, fisheries, state, et cetera. And we're putting filters and it can draw the filter in any shape you want. And they say, what, what do you want? Uh, what information you want to be alerted of and how do you want to be alerted? Do you want an email alert? Do you want a, a CSV file? Do you want a graphic? Uh, at, at what circumstances are the entering area, a speed restriction, a type of vessel entering area, what have you. So the, the, those who want information can filter it down, just get information they need and not have a whole bunch of information they have to look at. It'll automatically send that information alerts to them. So we work on this watchdog system. This is with the Arctic Domain Awareness Center project with ourselves and, and, um, and, and the Alaska Maritime Prevention Response Network and all kind of developing this capability so we can further squeeze out more and more value out of IS. Uh, so that's really my thing. We're really taking Arctic uh, maritime domain awareness and management and, and really expanding tremendously uh, with the AS capability. And having served in the Coast Guard for 33 years before I started the Marine Exchange, it's amazing to me how much information we have now and how much valuable, how valuable this. I wish I had it earlier. Uh, a lot of lives have been saved, a lot of uh, you know, casualty been, been averted and oil spills, et cetera. So uh, it's great to see in this presentation earlier with Ann, Christine, what have you, how people are taking this information and really uh, squeezing the value of it. And there's, and we're still getting better and better at it, quite honestly. That's my uh, 10 minutes, or it's going to two cents in 10 minutes. Terrific. Thanks so much, Captain Page. Um, you're literally getting the AS data in the hands of the locals there. It's really impressive. Uh, so I, I hope that this is the beginning. I know uh, the presenters here talk about this, um, you know, day in, day out, but I'm hoping that uh, there can be a potential conversation within IARPIC to build out that idea of working across these uh, uh, science, uh, academic, and practi practitioner worlds. Uh, and it's something that I'm, I'm going to try to facilitate. But, but again, a lot of what we do at IARPIC is driven by the, the community writ large. Uh, thinking about the five-year plan, uh, Jonathan and I are really uh, hoping to, to get some um, uh, uh, input in, in these calls. So that said, I know there's probably a lot of questions, uh, but we do have um, eight or so minutes. Uh, I would like to open it up to those that have questions that are related to and give us some idea of um, potential ways forward that we should be thinking about uh, to shape that five-year plan coming up. So with that said, I'm going to open it up to, to questions and comments. Uh, Mike, John Middleman here um, with a couple of comments. First of all, um, the presentations were fantastic. Um, and <laughs> I'd like to follow up with, with several of the speakers. Um, two comments, I'll just keep it short. One is uh, FYI for, for information for all those concerned. Um, we at uh, Naval Research Lab are working with the Canadian um, lab in, in Halifax, uh, DRDC, to um, try to gather more environmental data from the Arctic and um, link it back to uh, NRL and DRDC via satellite communications. Um, 
this was a, a, a kind of a new project that uh, may greatly uh, assist in uh, risk assessment and risk management. Uh, Captain Page, uh, probably a, a, a good opportunity to, uh, to communicate with you on, on this one. Uh, and the other thing is um, that the, uh, the US Coast Guard, um, I'm trying to think, Scott Gray, uh, has brought up the, um, the AIS field that doesn't exist for polar class of vessels. And it may be of interest to this community to petition ITU, uh, Jorge Arroyo, to include one of the uh, reserved or um, future use kind of things to indicate polar class of vessels. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in your comments on that. Over. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Dr. Middleman. We do have other I IARPIC uh, leads on the call. So. Can I say something real quick on that? Uh, back to uh, Middleman. Um, I agree. I think it's a great idea. And I don't. I feel kind of uh, I'm remiss because I'm just in dialogue with Ari Aurora on on the classification for AIS, and that completely skipped that idea. We talked about a lot of improving and giving more information on vessels like cargo vessel. Can we narrow it down to maybe container vessel versus a bulker versus a car carrier? Those make a big difference. But the polar class is an excellent idea. And so I, I too will advocate that uh, uh, incorporating that capability because they are working on expanding those fields and that's right on because certainly certain vessels shouldn't be in certain waters. They have to be, meet the criteria and that's where you're coming from obviously. So. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. I, I'm fully on board with that and I will support and help fight that cause, if you will. Great. So, um, uh, Bill Manley asked to show a slide briefly. Bill, um, go ahead. If you're talking, you're on mute. I wanted to provide a really quick update that just in the last few days, the Arctic Research Mapping application uh, has added uh, ship track positions and recent ship tracks, um, ship positions and ship tracks over an AIS subscription for about 20 selected uh, research vessels. So I'm gonna just do a quick demo here. We're gonna turn off the research project locations. We're gonna zoom in here to north of Norway and Svalbard. And you can see these uh, research vessels that are uh, going to support the mosaic expedition and the polar stern there. And so this information is updated uh, if everything's running well about every four hours and you get some information about the polar stern as well as the support vehicles. And I'm gonna make this really quick. These are the 20 vessels that we are um, ingesting and uh, and that aligns with um, the AUS and IARPIC recent compilation of research vessels to watch for this coming summer and um, uh, let us know if you have any feedback on that. It's a new feature just out. Great. Th thank you, Bill. Reactions, thoughts, something I, I want to kind of propose as a topic to expand. Clearly, we're focused on really the technical aspects of, of these tools getting access to AS data, but there's also that as aspect related to governance and partnership building, and in particular, building out the capacity to effectively engage uh, a range of stakeholders to include local communities. This is something that the IARPIC uh, and, and the, the larger science community in the Arctic uh, really um, focuses on. Um, many scientists look at how do we effectively uh, interact with local communities. So I want to throw that out there. There's a social aspect to, to all of this. I'd like to hear more about that, hopefully, in, in future conversations. Understanding that that's another big topic. Others, comments, questions? Uh, you know, I think on the governance side there, uh, Mike, I think uh, the Coast Guard had a very good article on, uh, Arctic, I think it was Arctic Governor or Governor, Maritime Governance here in their Proceedings magazine a couple months ago, but it, governance is a very complicated issue because it's all different levels of governance and, and jurisdiction and capabilities. And some is beyond, in fact, the things we're doing are beyond the reach of the Coast Guard, quite honestly, because the industry has its own standards of care. So the Coast Guard can only require you to, to have your AIS out to 12 miles. 
every vessel that rolls with the Marine Exchange, it's required to keep their IS out to 200 miles, otherwise they're breach of contract. So it's kind of interesting how you can do some things to uh, other governance levels as far as industry standards and trade and criteria, and there's state governance, there's local governance, there's port governance, and, and uh, international governance or standards, if you will, but it, it, it's a pretty complicated issue. And I think it's a good one to understand what you can and cannot do and how you get things done no matter what. It's so ways to you know, get. Yeah, certainly, uh, th thanks Captain Page. Certainly challenging. I think this is where uh, uh, big picture um, framings like spatial data infrastructure really can do some work at those, those challenges. Clearly the governance aspect to access usability is, is a challenge, especially when you get into um, uh, articulating requirements from the range of stakeholders and having that influence the design of these, these systems for usability. And that's really what the co-production method is about. Um, we got one minute left. This has been a terrific meeting. I want to thank everyone for all of your time. I do hope this is an ongoing going conversation. Please reach out. Um, we'll make sure we get our contact information out to you if you don't have it already. We do want to hear your thoughts on ways forward. This is one topic that we can bring up and, you know, potential to build out in the IARPIC plan um, and, you know, related topics uh, more broadly around access and usability, but as specific as possible would help us, coming from you helps us drive uh, uh, some of our, our suggestions for this, this uh, upcoming five-year plan. Uh, any, any other closing remarks, Jonathan, do you want anything? No, I just wanna thank all of our speakers and next month we're gonna branch out in a different direction, looking at the, um, the other domains within IARPIC, in particular, uh, the atmosphere and terrestrial domains, and I'll be reaching out to those team leads pretty soon to put an agenda together. Great, thanks so much. So, 2 p.m., uh, I think we're ready to close the meeting. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.